Climate anxiety. It's not an easy thing to talk about. But what's become clear to me is that it's a huge issue for people all around the world. Knowing what's coming is really frightening. Someone is sitting on my chest. How much I worry, how much I feel. A sort of guilt that comes out. Really helpless. What can I do? What's going to happen? And so I want to understand what we can do about it. It's so important that we use this anxiety to turn it into action. And how ultimately we can build tools for resilience. Grief is a good feeling to go through because you'll come out of it stronger. No matter who you are, it's becoming clear to me that climate anxiety is easier to cope with when you know others also share those feelings. It is not something that we are alone in. We are all fighting it and feeling that anxiety together. We could be on the sustainability revolution. This shared climate anxiety by my generation, that is going to be a massive force of willpower to push us in a positive direction. I want to discover if it's possible to turn climate anxiety from a rational but paralyzing fear into a force for change. One nation may have found the answer, and they've done so by realizing that at the core of climate anxiety is a profound sense of loss. To describe Iceland, it's often called the island of fire and ice. Here we have big glaciers, active volcanoes, high mountains, big floodplains where you can look over two, three hundred kilometers without anything being in your way. I've had the opportunity to speak with Maya, a glacier guide from southern Iceland, to understand Icelanders' strong connection to the glaciers and their feelings of loss as they disappear. So I'm brought up on this farm uh, in the south. From my farm, I can actually see three ice caps. From glaciers, I, I get this energy. It does something to your soul. It's a little bit unsettling to see them getting smaller and smaller and feeling that power leave us in a sense. It, it's really, it's in our name. The country's name is Iceland. What is it without ice? Central to climate anxiety is the fear of what we will lose. It could be the loss of stability, the loss of some of our dreams for the future, or in places on the front lines, the loss of homes and loved ones. For Icelanders, this loss is marked by an ominous, unstoppable thaw that's transforming their homeland. Wow. Here we have it. <laughs> Sole Majogut. I'm not going to try and pronounce the name, but it is absolutely magnificent. Yeah, it's, it's a beauty for sure. And so you've been coming to this glacier since you were how old? I first came here when I was a kid, and then I started guiding here in uh, 2015. And if we were stood here like, I don't know, 20 years ago, where would, where would the start of the glacier be? Uh, we would be underneath ice. It right would actually, here. yeah, it would actually go back, like... All the way down there. Yeah, yeah, quite far into the valley. Should we go and have a closer look? Yeah, definitely. If the temperature continues to increase as it is, how much longer will these glaciers be around for? Well, at this rate, we would have about 200 years, roughly. And then they're gone. Then, then we have no glaciers in Iceland. That's a really mind-blowing thought. Yeah, it's kind of tough to think about. Woo! Made it to the top. Yeah, here we are. Do you ever get bored of that view? No, it's, it's so beautiful. I could look at it all day. How does it make you feel looking out over it? It's both amazing, you know, the, the scenery, it's so raw, 
but it's also saddening because I can see marks of where the glacier used to be, mm. like where the river is streaming out from the lake. That's where the glacier was 2008. Wow. I can see the chains and it's, it's rapid. Terrifying and beautiful all at the same time. Yeah. It's only when you actually get up close to the glacier that you realize the sheer scale of them. The amount of water that is being stored in that ice. And when we talk about temperature rise, it seems like relatively small numbers, like one degrees, 1.5 degrees. But that small number is all it takes to melt all of this ice. Faced with this destiny, Icelanders have embraced a tried and tested method of coping with loss, grieving. Grieving works because it acknowledges the reality of their loss and the feeling it provokes. Just three years ago, in a national outpouring of grief, Iceland held a funeral for the first glacier to disappear. A memorial service is taking place in Iceland today to commemorate the loss of a 700-year-old glacier. It's been reduced to the size of a small patch of ice on top of a volcano. Anxiety is something that can build up and build up and build up. While grief, at least to me, it's more of a road that you go. It's a good feeling to go through because you, you come out of it stronger. Having the, the funeral helped people, realizing that their feelings were valid and that it was okay to feel sad. But it also helped us like realizing that we are the people that can actually change it, our, our generation. I think and I hope that this ceremony will be an inspiration not only to us here in Iceland, uh, but also for the rest of the world. The hope of this collective public grieving is to get Icelanders to move beyond their anxiety to action on a nationwide scale and it's being led from the very top. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine today, and you? Good, very good, thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet yeah. you too. Thank you for making time for this. Yes, absolutely. I'm in Reykjavik, Iceland's capital city, as I've been lucky enough to be granted an interview with Iceland's prime minister, Katrin Jakobsdottir. The glaciers have very multiple significance for us because a big part of our green energy, our renewable energy comes from glaciers. They are uh, a very important part of our landscape. And I, I actually firmly believe that landscape somehow affects you, shapes you, who you are. And the glaciers have also become very symbolic for the climate crisis in Iceland. I truly understand it when I meet Icelandic young people who are looking me in the eye and saying, you know, what you're doing now really matters for us. Mm. And, and I think it's so important that we use this anxiety also to turn it into action, as you say yourself. But I also, also always say when I'm talking to those young people, everybody can make a difference, but it's also very important to hold governments mm -hmm. and big corporations accountable. Because I wanted to know how Katrin felt about the importance of grieving for the loss of the glacier and what she hopes it represents. The message is maybe all about the importance that we act now. Right now we have that opportunity to change the future uh, for those generations that come you know, in our footsteps. So it's really all about the choices we make now. Do you think there's a relationship between that, between sort of displaying that grief and then getting to that place of action? Well, traditional politics have been shaped by men yeah. <laughs> throughout the centuries. Uh, and you know, that's maybe a more feminine way of looking at it, that it's quite okay to show your emotions. And they are a very important part of our existence and we need those emo emotions to drive that change. Yeah, yeah. I think that has a lot to do with it. <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, and so it was such a pleasure just to have that conversation. I don't think I've ever met a world leader or a person in a position of power and had such a human down-to-earth conversation yeah. like that and an amazing, amazing woman. It's just so moving to come here and it's reminding me of where my journey first started, which is on a glacier in Greenland about six or seven years ago and visiting that glacier changed my life.
There's something about seeing those huge, ancient, frozen blocks of ice just melting. And this will never be the same. And if my grandkids come here, there'll be no glacier at all if things carry on as it's going. That's a, a mind-blowing thought. And it's amazing to see how the Icelanders are processing that. They're acknowledging their, their grief. And there's something very powerful about that because it's saying, we see what's happening. We understand what's happening. And we're going to make a change. And that's something I want to figure out how to take back into my own life. Can my own climate anxiety become less overwhelming if I also confront my loss and take action to help others? Right then, I guess it's time to try grieving. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Days is one of my closest friends and an incredible environmental campaigner. She's achieved so many amazing things, including getting the term eco-anxiety recognized by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. She really believes in the power of sitting with grief and embracing your feelings. I think grief is kind of like, I feel like it's the beginning. So it's like, this is the start to like where the healing comes in later. So tell me a little bit about grief workshops. You've mentioned this term to me. <laughs> I feel like that might be where we're headed. Yeah. Tell me, I, I, what are they? Like, how do they work? What are they? It's basically just creating space to hold the grief, to hold the loss, to hold the sorrow, and processing it with a trained facilitator who can take you on that journey. I'm a little bit nervous about what we're going to do, <laughs> not going to lie. Um, but I feel safe hearing you speak about it and, yeah. and seeing And where... I'm here to hold you, too. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't do it without you, Days. You are my guide in this. <laughs> and I just would love to invite you to just breathe. I'd actually invite you to do nothing. And just whatever you need to just bring to this session, just bring it. Different like practices can be used in it, whether it's you know the active listening or something like journaling. I know it's a practice that lots of people like. You could do it with your friends even, <laughs> you know, and that's just basically saying, I'm giving space for us to have this conversation. I'm giving space for us to put down these feelings and try and work through them in the best ways that we know we can. It's really good sometimes to just scream. You feel angry, you feel overwhelmed, scream. So you pick up a pillow and you just go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just let it rip. Just go for it. <laughs> oh, that's pretty decent. <laughs> You know, in society, we're so taught that, like, you don't cry, you don't show people your feelings, you don't let people know that you're hurting. But then this is, like, the opposite. It's going, actually, no, let people know that you're hurting. Ask for help, ask for assistance. It's all part of the feelings that make up the broad spectrum of human emotions. Mm. And we have to feel them, mm. and we have to sit with them, mm. but we don't have to sit in them. That was um, definitely an amazing experience. It wasn't what I was expecting it to be. I kind of, like... Going into it, I was sort of nervous of, I don't know, sort of like crying my eyes out. I just, I didn't know what I was going into. I think what we learned today are tools that, that anyone can use wherever you are in the world. And it, it's just naming your grief, the worst thoughts that you have, saying them out loud. And I found that when you do that, the sort of crippling power of them is, is taken away for a moment. And then you start to sort of look forward to the future, to taking action, to kind of harnessing that sense of dread, anxiety, fear, shame, guilt, whatever it is, and, and turning it into something more positive and, and more hopeful. It seems people are finding ways to acknowledge what we'll lose from climate change and how scary that is. Personally, I've been worried about climate change for years but this is the first time that I've been taught skills about how to process what I'm feeling. And it's got me wondering why this isn't something we're taught at school. Why doesn't every kid in the country get told not just about our heating world, but about how they can cope with the impact of that knowledge? I'm up very, very early, but excited to meet an amazing young woman who's trying to do just that. 
by changing how the education system supports teachers in communicating the climate and ecological crisis. And where else would we have this conversation than an ice rink in the heart of Coventry? She became the youngest person to have an A-level in politics and government. She's an active member of the school climate strike. If we have any hope, there goes a future Prime Minister of this country. Scarlett Westbrook. At just 17, as well as being a keen ice skater, Scarlett has already helped write seven party manifestos and three parliamentary bills, and is working with the organisation Teach the Future to have the Climate Education Bill pushed through Parliament and into law. Thank you very much. If there's anyone who illustrates the power of turning at least some of your anxiety into agency, it's Scarlett. When I wrote the bill, I was only listening to like Stormzy and Dave and like at midnight, <laughs> so it was really quiet. You, you listened to Stormzy and Dave when you wrote the political the bill. bill. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing I've ever heard. I want to understand why changing education is so important. But first, I get a quick flash lesson in just how much I could have achieved before turning 18 if I was half as amazing as Scarlett. In year three, so that's age seven for me, we had a day about climate change. So I asked my teacher if I could like take control of the lesson. I actually won an award for my year. I convinced my parents to let me door knock two political parties. So age 12, I decided I wanted to do an A-level. At the time, there were no textbooks. Or At this point, I'm just wondering what I've been doing with my life for the past 28 years. That's, I mean, I'm kind of blown away. <laughs> like, teaching classes at seven, I think I was just picking my nose at seven. Um, it sounds like you've been lucky enough to have amazing teachers on this, and as you said, you've taken it upon yourself to, to teach yourself a lot. Do you think there are enough resources in schools for young people, and also, I guess, resources for teachers to like be able to teach this, to learn how to handle this topic? Um, I think definitely not. So I'm part of a group, actually leading group Teach the Future, which is a campaign to implement climate education widely, um, not just in the sciences, but into every single subject, because everybody is going to be affected by the climate crisis, regardless of their vocation. So every single subject should teach people how their subject will be impacted by the climate crisis. I could literally listen to you talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think that that bill is a, an important part of getting young people to connect to to the natural world and do you think that's an important part of tackling the crisis? I think without education we don't have the tools needed to be able to work on solutions or even work on coping ourselves. So looking at climate anxiety for example, people are often anxious about things they don't know about. So if they're given that knowledge and those tools and resources, they're not going to feel as isolated in what they're feeling and also like we'll be able to see how this started how we go about changing it and have that agency. It would also mean that teachers are given the tools and resources needed to teach students about the climate crisis. Getting emotional, you're <laughs> honestly amazing. Yeah. Hey, you're amazing. <laughs> no, you're amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> it's a lot, hey? Yeah. It was so inspiring hearing Scarlett's ambition to change the education system. Meeting people like her has made me think about what I can do. So I've been working with our team and Clover Hogan on some film resources for teachers. I hope they can use them to help students who are feeling climate anxiety to find ways to process it, to recognise it as an emotionally healthy response and something that can even be a force for good. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling a little bit nervous actually. Really? And I'm excited to be sharing them today in my home city. Uh, is this the first time you're showing a film to anyone? Yeah, this is the first time that anyone will have seen the film. Wow. I think we just got to start about to descend upon us. Yeah, it's a little bit nervous. Do you know what? I feel more nervous doing this stuff than I do interviewing Obama. Wow. <laughs> wow, I just casually <laughs> dropped that one. Good job. <laughs> okay, so if you come here. Let's go. Bags and coats need to be in here. Let's go. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Happy it's Friday. <laughs> They're normally much louder than this. <laughs> I'm keen to start by finding out how they feel about the climate crisis. It makes me feel worried because we never know what will come next. It makes me feel vulnerable because it feels like anything could happen. Uh, I'm sad because I feel like we can't really affect it because we're just kids right now. Put your hand up if you heard someone else share an emotion that you can also relate to. 
Pretty much everyone, yeah. These young people are echoing what I've heard from other young people around the world. It's now time to show them our short film. It's a mixture between panic and fear. Even like if the sun is shining or if you're happy, it's just always there. How much I worry, how much I fear, my, my anger towards inaction. Nightmares that I died because of a flash flood or I lost my parents. I never want to be this powerless or this anxious or this stressed or this sad again. And I started taking action. What gives me hope is that our youngest generations are acting. Learning about the efforts that we can implement and have implemented to help protect the earth is comforting. No matter what happens, I am not alone and I never will be. There's a revolution out there and I know that eventually we will succeed. I wonder if anyone wants to be brave after that maybe and just share how it made them feel. It makes me feel like proud that we're all coming together against this crisis and that we could all like sympathize with each other and it's given me hope and making me feel optimistic that we can beat this crisis. To hear that other young people are worried about it and they want to do something about it, it helps you be like, okay, we can all do this together, we can find a way to do this, even though we're so young. It's nice to know that a lot of different people from different cultures are taking action and thinking the same way that we are thinking. The thing that makes the anxiety and the fear worse is the idea that you're the only one feeling like this. It's very isolating. And what's been amazing for me is the more I talk about it, the more I realize that many other people are feeling like this. And in a way, we're sort of stronger together in those feelings. And there's something really empowering and uplifting about that. I feel really, really energized after having done that. Hearing their feelings before we showed the film and then listening to their reaction after and, and seeing the impact it had on them to understand that they're not alone in those feelings. Not only do their mates feel it all around them, but young people all around the world are feeling the same feelings. And that seemed to go a long way towards making them feel a whole lot better and a lot more hopeful about the issue. The thing about this issue is that it isn't going away anytime soon. In fact, it's likely going to get worse before it gets better. For me, I think the thing that I'm going to take away the most from this journey is just voicing how I feel taking the time to check in on your friends and ask, how are you doing? And allowing space for us not to be okay as well, just to express that you're struggling because that's not only okay, but it's natural in the face of this crisis. For so long, I've allowed my climate anxiety to get on top of me. It likely will at times again in the future. But now I feel I have the tools to move past those dark moments. None of us can save the world on our own. But I've found that by realizing my anxiety is shared by many other young people around the world, by grieving for what I know will be lost, and by joining many others in taking action in my own community, where I live, I find it easier to cope. And even more than that, it's given me the belief that from our generation's climate anxiety can come the determination to really change our future and look after each other whilst doing so. Hey, thank you for watching our documentary and a huge thank you to all the contributors who made it possible. Whilst making this series, we had the chance to work with Clover's amazing team at Force of Nature to create a teaching guide and some educational films on climate anxiety. So if you're a teacher or you'd like your teacher to access these materials, you can do that by the Force of Nature website.